So I'll be talking about the uh, female sports division and just how fair it is to allow trans females to compete in that uh, sports division. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the biological basis for the male dominance of athletic performance, which we can't deny exists. Then I'm going to talk about the physiology of the trans female athlete. And then I'm going to talk about how can we possibly level this playing field. So starting with part one, there's no denying that males dominate athletic performance. So if we're talking about speed events, based on world records, males are 10% faster. If we're talking about strength events like powerlifting or uh, uh, long jump, we're talking about a 20 to 25% uh, athletic dominance uh, based on world records by males. And then endurance, like marathons, 10 to 12% faster. And this is all because males have a superior athletic uh, performance because they have different male physiology. They have a physiology that's different to females. This starts from uh, in utero effects where we have masculinization of the brain, which allows males to be more aggressive and competitive. They have a stronger body composition and they have enhanced cardiovascular and respiratory systems. So a lot of this uh, enhanced uh, male physiology and athletic performance is based around the fact that males and females have different sex hormone milieus. So females predominantly have estradiol and males predominantly have testosterone. But it's not all or one or all or none. So females also produce small amounts of testosterone and males also produce um, small amounts of estradiol. So if we look at the average level of testosterone in a male, it's around 20.4 nanomolar. And this is produced predominantly by the testes with some, uh, uh, some also being produced from the adrenal glands. In females, our concentration on average is around 0.9 nanomolar, so less than one nanomolar and it's produced uh, in the ovaries and also in the adrenal glands. So in any uh, given day, the circulating level of testosterone in a male is around 15 to 20 times more than what we see in females. And testosterone has this pleiotrophic effect in, the, in males. So it doesn't just look, at, look after the, the reproductive system, but it has effects on the mood of the, of, of the male, affects the brain. It affects their muscles, their kidneys, making EPO, which helps to carry oxygen around the body. It affects bone and bone strength, and these are all things I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail. But first of all, I just want to talk about testosterone affects males across the entire lifespan, not just in their adult life. So it begins in utero, where we have effects. And one of the major effects of the in utero testosterone is in the masculinization of the brain. So this masculinization of the brain leads to permanent and irreversible effects. And this leads to what we distinguish as male-like behavior, such as rough and tumble play, as you can see. Little boys tend to, to uh, accumulate in packs and fight against each other, or they tend to be more aggressive and competitiveness, competitive in their playtime. So one of the indicators that we can use in the, in the laboratory to see if somebody might be more exposed to androgens than, than another person is to look at the digit length of their fourth digit. So in males, this tends to be longer than the second digit. And so that, that they have what's called a lower 2D to 4D ratio. And this is an indicator of more in utero androgen exposure. And what's been shown in the sporting field, and I'm just showing you one example, is that if we consider soccer players, those players that ha get more yellow cards and more red cards and more aggressive and competitive, they have this lower uh, uh, 4D to 2D ratio, which means they've had more in utero androgen exposure and so have more aggressive male-like uh, brain behavior. So moving on from those in utero effects, we also have our adult life effects. And one of the major effects of, of adult life testosterone when we're considering sporting performance is on our muscles and our bones. And this occurs as males go through puberty. So they start off very similar size uh, to, to females, but as they go through puberty, they get more muscles and longer and stronger bones. The fact that um, this all occurs during puberty 
And as testosterone increases during puberty, we start to see those athletic performance differences that we see in the world records. So for example, if we just consider running, a young boy age nine, he only has about a 3% chance of beating a girl. However, by age 19, that's up to that 10 to 11% increase in athletic performance. For swimming, similar kind of statistics. And then for long jump or strength-related uh, events, we start off at around 6% difference between boys and girls, and this then gets up to that 20% uh, athletic dominance by, by males. And this all occurs as the testosterone levels increase during puberty. So to, to, to show you that it's testosterone that's increasing that muscle mass, there was a very elegant study done uh, back in the 1990s where men were treated for five months with uh, testosterone injections. And after these five months, they measured their muscle mass and their muscle strength. And what we see is that as the dose of testosterone increased from around physiological levels, 18.8, up to high uh, physiological, supraphysiological levels at 82, we see this increase in muscle mass. So there's a direct correlation, more testosterone, more muscle mass. If men exercise while they were having their testosterone, those, testos those uh, muscle mass differences were even more enhanced. Now, one thing I want to show you is that even at the low doses of, of testosterone in these men, even at those low doses, we didn't see a decrease in the amount of muscle mass. So if somebody was on a really low dose of testosterone for a male, what we'd expect to see if there was muscle atrophy is this decrease in the data. But instead, there was no. It just fluctuated around the baseline, meaning that even low-dose testosterone can maintain male muscle mass. Then we have this other phenomenon called muscle memory. So if you go to the gym and you train your butts out for the next three months, and then you decide to go on a cruise, cruise around the world for the next three months and do nothing, then you come back to the gym, you'll be back to to somewhat of your sedentary state. But once you start exercising, you're gonna get stronger and faster, a lot quicker than you did in your initial stage. And this is called muscle memory, and it's testosterone that's driving that muscle memory phenomena. So an example of that is seen here in East German data, where back in the uh, 70s, there was this statewide uh, doping of their uh, athletes. And what we see here is a uh, softball, uh, sorry, uh, uh, shot putter, who was given androgens, and the androgens are down the bottom in those squares. And so for a few months they were given androgens, or, or testosterone, and what we see is an increase as they were given those testosterone in their shot put distance. So increased with the amount of testosterone. Then they stopped competing and they stopped getting their androgens for a few months, and then it started again in July. And what we see is that their baseline didn't go back to their former level. It started higher and it accelerated much faster. And this is due to that muscle memory effect. So it affects muscles and it also affects bones. And so one of the things about um, males is that males have increased bone structure and bone strength. So they have increased length of their uh, levers so they can have uh, longer reach and fulcrum pressure but they also have a bigger articular surface, and so that allows them to put down more muscle in the first place. So if, if you compare that to females, females only have 44% on average, uh, uh, they have 44% lower upper body strength and 28% lower lower body strength, simply because muscles, uh, males can put down more muscle. Females, like I said before, have estradiol, and one of the things estradiol promotes during uh, puberty is the widening of the pelvis, and that change of, uh, that, that, that widening of the pelvis changes the hip adduction, and so that, that makes females intrinsically slower because they have a different rate of rotation through those uh, hip muscles and hip joints. The estradiol also promotes ligament loosening, and so females are more prone to, to injuries, and they lay down more fat mass. Now, fat is absolutely essential for reproduction and fertility, but it's got nothing to do with athletic performance, and so kilo for kilo, males are always gonna be stronger. 
So the other thing that we know about males is that they have a bigger aerobic capacity. So females, we have to have our diaphragm set higher because we're going to have a baby uh, growing in, in, our, in our abdomen, this area. And so we have to sit up higher. So males uh, have a lower diaphragm and a larger lung size from birth. Also, during that in utero postnatal uh, phase that I was talking about with testosterone, what testosterone drives is increased alveolar multiplication. So what these are little sacs within the lung that trap the oxygen and give it to the blood. So males can intrinsically take more oxygen in and then put it into the blood. So males can deliver more oxygen to the blood. Then relative for size, because our heart is actually a muscle, we know testosterone increases muscle size, it also increases heart size. So for any male of the same size compared to a female of the same size, they'll actually have a bigger heart. If you've got a bigger heart, you can pump more oxygen out to your uh, tissues in your body, including your skeletal muscles. So the uh, muscles in a male can get more oxygenated blood, which is much better for their aerobic capacity. So let's just put all of this into context if we're talking about male physiology and athletic performance. They've got masculinization of the brain, which makes them more competitive and aggressiveness, aggressive. They have increased or stronger, longer bone structure, and they have uh, enhanced bone mass and makes them stronger, less uh, prone to injury. They have this muscle memory effect that's been driven by testosterone. They have an increase in lung capacity, increase in heart size. Then they also have this post-pubertal effect of testosterone driving muscle mass. And we know that for five months in males, even at very low doses, 10 nanomolar, it will maintain muscle mass for at least five months. So let's now convert that to the trans female athlete that's going to come and compete against a cis uh, female athlete. So testosterone levels for females sit in this range, 0 to 2.8. And then the male range is 10, uh, about 7.7 .7 to 29.4. So let's call it 8 to, to around 30. That's the range for males. And so at the moment, the IAC rules, or the rules that are governing our sport, is that estradiol therapy is required for a trans female athlete to lower their testosterone to 10 nanomolar for one year. For some sports, it's just six months. So we're sitting the, the, the cutoff between the two divisions at 10 nanomolar, which we can see quite clearly here falls within the male range, and it's much higher than any cis female could, could, could even try to attain uh, nat naturally. They just can't attain that naturally. So if we're reformatting the XY, so the, the male athlete to a trans female athlete using estradiol, what then is going to be retained? What male physiology will be retained? We already know that there's in utero permanent effects that are going to maintain that masculinization of the brain. The bone structure and mass uh, will, will, be, will stay the same. Muscle memory, it's there, it persists for life. Heart size, lung capacity are not going to change. Testosterone at 10 nanomole per litre, the concentrations that are given, will maintain muscle mass. So, we, we, we have this athlete, but they're on estradiol therapy. So what is that going to do? So estradiol therapy will lower their testosterone to 10 nanomole per litre, because that's what's required. It will lead to ligament loosening, so that will make these athletes more prone to injury. And it will increase their fat mass. So for that particular athlete, going from their male physiology to their trans female physiology, will feel weaker uh, kilo to kilo, because they're going to have less muscle mass compared to their fat mass. So to how does this affect performance of a, uh, an athlete? So here we've got an XY athlete that is uh, taking estradiol therapy due to regulations. So those regulations were introduced in 2011. So in 2008, uh, this particular athlete could run 800 metres in 124 seconds. 2009 joined the national team and won an international event at 115 seconds. 2010 it was around 117 seconds, so fluctuating best times. Then estradiol therapy started. And we can see that it was 2011, 12 and 13, 
slight decrease in, in the best times. And it wasn't until 2014, so three years to four years of estradiol therapy, we started to see any kind of significant change in the performance. Now that performance was only 5.7% uh, decrease. And I'll just bring you back to the world record for this particular event, 10% difference between males and females. So is that enough? So how can we possibly level the uh, female division uh, in, in a safe way for, for cis females? So at the moment, elite biological female athletes have a testosterone range from zero to 2.8. Trans female athletes can compete with 10 nanomolar per liter testosterone. So it's already higher than a, female, a biological female could, could attain. And we already know that testosterone is having these dose-dependent effects on muscle mass and bone strength. There is talk that this is going to be reduced to 5 nanomolar. It was supposed to be announced last year uh, in 2018, but that hasn't happened. Uh, IAC may make that uh, 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 change this year. But it might see a 5 nanomolar. That is still much higher than what we see for the, uh, f the female range. This 5 nanomolar is here and now. This is not considering the uh, permanent in utero pubertal effects of testosterone. It's not uh, even considering the inconsistent times at the moment for estradiol therapy, six months for some sport, 12 months for others. And that testosterone can actually maintain muscle mass for a long period of time. And 5 nanomolar remains still a lot higher than the levels that are attainable for biological females. So while a lot of people are talking about trans females and how we can include those into the female division uh, sport, people have to start standing up for the elite biological female athletes and saying, well, are we creating a fair level ground uh, for, for these athletes? So I just want to acknowledge my university, where I'm from, and also I'm part of the WISPA High Performance Sport Group. Thank you. So there's not a lot of information out there, but what is known is that, or what has been shown is at the moment, no. Because a lot of the androgen uh, actually happened in utero, a lot of that's actually set up uh, uh, for, for the little boy to be uh, masculinized brain and the female. So it's only when, uh, let's, for want of a better word, something goes wrong and they're exposed to the wrong kind of androgens or the wrong kind of estrogen levels during the in utero that we can actually see these effects, but that's not what you're talking about. So really trying to understand the transgender brain, it's still a lot of research is actually happening on that uh, as we speak. In, in countries like Sweden and Amsterdam, there's big clinical trials underway just to try and understand how the different trans female and trans male brains uh, before and after transitioning. So it's, it's a, a, a hot topic of physiology at the moment.